So, what are we doing on the show this time, Tim? Moving with Batman. What? Brought to you by GC Cola. (laughs) It's a mad, 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 mad idea, Tim. You're no Nancy Sinatra. Oh no, Paul. Check this out. Who will buy this wonderful bat cave? Such a cave you never did see. Who will buy this map made of lucite? No sale. To To the the bat bat poles! Welcome to To the Bat Poles, the voice of an old generation. Uh, (laughs) This is Tim in Tokyo with Paul in Hanover, New Hampshire. Right on, brother! Uh, No, sorry, but that's the sound of my arteries hardening. (laughs) Uh, Our opening theme this time was from the YouTube channel The Big Smuzz, attributed to Smuzz's band 30 Going on 13, a punk rock cover of Hefty's Batman theme. Mm-hmm. Does that make us 54, 53, 56 going on 13? Probably. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> um, the Cold Open, uh, what inspired me to write that one was, of course, well, we did the uh, Move In With Nancy TV special and our special about the special uh, that we uh, put out over the holidays. And when we recorded that three years ago for Patreon... Uh, we dug into the background of a lot of songs, but for some reason we we didn't do that with Who Will Buy. I think part of it might have been that I got, I, speaking for myself anyway, I got distracted with the strange cut in the song that's not on the album, just cut in the special, and with the dancers, mm-hmm. and with the amusement park, and <laughs> and I forgot to look up where the song came from. And we got an email after the special came out in our feed here uh, from listener Maynard, who points out that it's from the musical Oliver. Okay. Which answers our question about why the song has that long instrumental break for dancing. (laughs) Yes, that's true. Uh, And I found the scene uh, on the video of it on the internet, the scene from the 1968 movie. So it's interesting because in the musical as it's normally performed, it starts out with all these street vendors who Mm -hmm. are calling out the various things that they're selling, who will buy this or that. Sure, sure. Mm And uh, Maynard, pointing out that that movie came out in 68, writes, maybe Nancy was auditioning for the role? (laughs) Interesting. Well, it was a super popular musical right around that time. Mm -hmm. Popular enough that a movie was made of it pretty pretty quickly. Well, I believe it was Oliver, yeah, in in 64, the same episode of Ed Sullivan that the Beatles first appeared on had some people performers from the stage you know the broadway production the broadway. of mm-hmm. oliver okay including <laughs> including davy jones uh, later of the monkeys uh, yes hmm who must have been what about 16 at the time i guess yeah he was actually 18 it was just two years before the monkeys were formed 
And uh, Maynard also wrote, you both always do a great show, uh, which means something to me because Maynard himself is a radio personality in Australia and a podcaster. So he knows what he's oh. talking about. <laughs> wow, that's. <laughs> I feel all oogie inside. That's a very, very nice, nice thing to say. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Maynard. Yes. Thank you, Maynard. I guess we'll have to start including more, you know, mates and no worries um, type phrases in our <laughs> in our discussions, just to make sure that we're um, uh, playing to the Australian crowd um, adequately. Yeah, all three of our Aussie listeners. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Or there might be more. Let us know out there if you're in Australia listening to this. Yeah, I'd love to know what you know. Occasionally, um, we get. Uh, I get. Um, some data crunched um, through one of the rating sites for um, for for uh, podcasts. I don't even remember which one now. Um, but occasionally, we're told that we're like you know the number one, <laughs> the number one uh, American TV podcast in Cyprus. Um, I have no idea if we have a listener <laughs> in Cyprus, or maybe somebody accidentally like downloads the podcast once in a while. <laughs> you know, perhaps the HAL Nine Thousand is downloading podcasts for posterity, and uh, you know, lives in Cyprus for some reason. Anyway, So our topic this time is the unproduced first draft script, Marsha, the Queen of Diamonds, by Tom Cannon Jr. and Jack Cash, uh, dated September 8, 1966. Or that's the date on the construction paper cover that uh, Greenway put on all of the scripts. The, uh, the title page from Cannon and Cash doesn't have a date on it, but... Yeah, I'd love to know what the date is. So uh, we'll link to the Canon and Cash PDF script in the show notes. And uh, did you notice that the title page has the the in it, the Queen of Diamonds, but the construction paper cover from Greenway doesn't have the the, which mm-hmm. kind of makes mm-hmm. me think that that's, that that's kind of how the the went away mm. <laughs> uh, in the in the Sherman version. It's interesting that in the initial Canon and Cash script, um, she's never referred to as Marsha in the script itself. It's always Queen of Diamonds, Queen of Diamonds, whenever mm. she has a line. It's almost as if Marsha was like an afterthought for them. So calling her the Queen of Diamonds was probably... I'm guessing that was more or less her name um, as far as the original um, writers were concerned. Yeah, that, yeah. And then by the time Sherman does his, she's Marsha much more than she's Queen of Diamonds. Yeah, and she's Marsha in the dialogue as well in the dialogue headers. Hmm. 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 Yeah, but through the script, she's all the script always calls her Queen Queen of Diamonds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When we talked about Sherman's letters to his girlfriend or his wife or whoever that was, um, mm-hmm. and we saw that uh, there was a mention of him being asked to rewrite the script. I guess rewrite means completely start over. <laughs> sure seems that way. Because, the you know, the Sherman script has virtually nothing to do with this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the names of the original writers aren't even on the cover of the script, although I do believe they're listed as, you know, story. They're given a story by credit in the episode. Are they? I not sure about well, maybe that. maybe not maybe they aren't well if i look in the booklet no the, there's no credit for for them just writer stanford sherman wow so hmm yeah i guess you're right so they came up with the character but were given no credit for it on screen apparently yeah well or did they i mean well you could tell um looking at this they knew I think they knew that they were writing a script for Zsa Zsa Gabor because she was originally going to be Marsha. Mm-hmm. And we don't necessarily know that Dozier himself didn't say, oh, we'll call her Marsha Queen of Diamonds or something. Yes. Yes, that, that may have been the only the only connection between them. But there certainly is um, an element of the script, uh, one element of the script anyway, that travels between the original and the Sherman version, but we'll, we'll get into that as we move forward. Mm-hmm. Did you notice uh, on the title page, there's a return address sticker? 
Mm -hmm. uh, for Arthur Kennard Associates, which I looked into it. It's a talent agency. Yeah, I kind of figured. And they repped a lot of big stars. I found mm -hmm. a whole list of people that they re uh, represented. Vincent Price, Raymond Burr, Sebastian Cabot. Hedy Lamar, Charles Lawton, Lon Chaney Jr., Peter Lorre, Boris Karloff, Mary Astor, and Dame Judith Anderson. Wow. Okay. <laughs> but do you think that they would have represented writers also? Is that why? This oh, yeah. There? Okay. Yeah, that's that. That's that's not a um, that's not a tough one at all. It's, okay. It's very likely that they they might have even. Um, sponsored or or managed other talent um beyond screenwriters and uh and stars as well okay how how would that have worked then did like the these writers find out from their agency or like the agency said oh maybe you could write a batman script or what's what would be the structure of this well, I, I don't have a lot of insight into that, but my general understanding of the situation would be that producers would occasionally call the talent agencies and say, I need a script for Batman, what do you got? Or mm -hmm. who have you got? And, um, you know, the Arthur Kennard Associates people would say, I know just the person, tell me what you want, and I'll, you know, send them a, you know, five-page write-up, and then they'll, you know, I'll give them the Bible or, you know, the style sheet or whatever. And uh, they'll, you know, I'll have a script to you in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So that would um, eliminate the difficulty of um, someone like Dozier or Horowitz having to go through the Rolodex to find individual screenwriters, mm -hmm. you know, to, you know, if they needed um, to, like, pile up a few scripts for later in the season or something like that. They could just call talent agents and the talent agents would take care of the organizational stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, wow, I mean... <laughs> These guys, I, I, in my notes, I just started calling them C and C. Because it's okay. easier. But yes. um, here and there, you see things that feel like the show. Mm -hmm. But other times, they wander so far from what the show had been up, you know, in season one. Um, just kind of ignore... Well, we'll get into the specifics, but a lot of things that, you know, the, they put in things in here that would just never happen on the show. Maybe not even in season three. Mm. And it felt like these guys read some Batman comics, watched a couple arcs of Batman in January or February 66. And then in the summer, they wrote the script based on those vague memories. <laughs> mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, there are, you know, at least a few different angles that we could um, that we could take to talk about how inappropriate the script is. Um, <laughs> one thing that um, you know struck me immediately, not immediately because you know, not because it's at the beginning of the script, but because uh, reading it the first time, it just struck me as so off base that it couldn't help. You know, we we had to comment on it. Is like miniature work and special effects mm -hmm. in the final act never. Never in a million years. They're not going to do any miniature work on this show. Um, it's not a it's not a science fiction show, um, and uh, beyond that, it's just not something that they had ever you know they'd ever even tried at this point. If there were going to be special effects, they would be superimpositions occasionally, like the lasers uh, or the bat laser or other kinds of superimpositions, like the fight words. That show up during fights um but um yeah it's, they're going to be pyrotechnics for the most part mm -hmm. um they're going to be stuff that happens in front of the camera not um not miniatures and mat shots yeah well i mean if the show was going to do miniatures it seems like that would have to be something they would decide at the beginning like mm -hmm. that will be an aspect of the show is doing things in miniature and to just right. say, oh, by the way, how about doing stuff in my script in miniature? I mean, it seems like there, there'd be a lot of startup costs in doing that, getting somebody who could do the miniature work, you know, make the models. And mm -hmm. um, it would doesn't seem like it would be cheap and it would be time consuming. Yeah, no, you know, on the plus side, studios like... 20th Century Fox would have had miniature departments or effects departments. This was a time before effects tended to be farmed out to consulting groups like, you know, Lucasfilms, uh, ILM, for example, yeah. um, or, you know, one of the other companies like that. But so there were still in-house effects groups. But by the 60s, those in-house effects groups were beginning to migrate into 
um, into consulting groups, and they primarily did opticals, um, like um, you know, titles and credits for the beginnings and ends of films, mm. um, things like that. Um, <clears throat> but you're, you're right that if there wasn't any understanding of like a budget or a team who would be dedicated, you know, within the 20th Century Fox special effects department, if it still existed at this point, and I'm not even sure that it did, there would have had to have been at least some people and money dedicated on a regular basis. So mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. I'm thinking right now that um, I think um, Fantastic Voyage, which is a film with lots and lots of miniature um, work, it's the film about... Um, the five or six people who get into a submarine, which is then miniaturized, so speaking of miniatures, and um, <laughs> shot into a guy's bloodstream to try to you know, um, operate on him from within, basically, and mm -hmm. save his life. Um, that's full of miniatures and some of the worst mat shots I've ever seen in my life. Um, it's hilarious. It's wonderful to watch. I mean, it's you know, it's it's very well done for 1966 or seven, but it is 66 or 67, so it would be just about this time. And I think that most of those effects were actually done in house. So 20th Century Fox could have done miniature stuff, but probably not for Batman, and probably not for any 25 minute a week or you know 50 minute a week television show. You know, maybe mm -hmm. for like Lost in Space, obviously, <laughs> and uh, other shows that were longer and more dedicated to um, special effects, you know, necessitated by science fiction. So there's that. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, you know, the bat plane and the bat cycle and or the bat cycle. Yeah, bat um, cycle. Yeah, it's like, you know, I'm going to throw the bat cycle and it will return to me. Oh, wait a minute, that's the bat orang I'm thinking of. Well, yeah, I felt like he wasn't realizing that it was called a bat orang to sound like boom orang, and that's where the uh comes from. And you don't, it, <laughs> they don't drive the batamobile. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they're Rossetti and Valentino, the Italian gangsters who put uh in everything. <laughs> wait a minute, that's an Arakua. Yes. <laughs> Um, old characters of don't think I didn't think of that <laughs> of Tim's yeah the the Batamobile the Batacave to the Batapoles <laughs> to the Batapoles uh, you've brought such joy to this old Italian stereotype by a calling on the Bataphone <laughs> oh man um, so there's that and also um, the the, uh, the stunt work. Like Robin, um, like, you know, flipping around on a tree branch, I think, at one point when he's fighting the goons. Well, um, he, he's hanging from it after the cliffhanger, which is a literal cliffhanger because he hmm. is on the bat -a cycle and goes over an embankment. And then at the beginning of part two, he's hanging from a limb. And yeah. the bat -a cycle is for some reason undamaged. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. So it must not have been that bad of an embankment, but anyway. Embankment. Pronounce it correctly, Tim. It's an embankment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so a few days before recording, I mean, I'm sorry it was such short notice, but I did put the put a thread about the script and a link to the script on the All Seeing, All Knowing 66 Batman message board. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. And I'll, I'll link to that so you can see. We got three comments, which I'll be okay. quoting from here. And okay. Scott Sebring wrote the most. He was first and wrote the most. And uh, the first thing that he thought about the script was the th same thing I thought at when reading page one, which was, quoting Scott, Man, Gotham has a lot of bridge ceremonies between this one and Bookworms. Because <laughs> it's just like Bookworms. I mean, apparently C and C did not watch the Bookworm arc because, or maybe they did, and they're just, it's just like George Harrison with My Sweet Lord, like accidentally plagiarizing it or something. <laughs> because, you know, they got the bridge opening ceremony going on. Bruce and Dick are watching it on TV. I was waiting mm -hmm. for Dick to spot. Two face in the crowd, <laughs> and then Gordon to get shot and fall off the bridge. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, how many bridge opening ceremonies do they have in a year? And then also, as uh, Scott pointed out, it should have been the mayor at the ceremony officiating over the ceremony, not Gordon. Right, right. 
but it seems like C and C were unaware of of uh, Mayor Linseed. Mm, mm-hmm. Or unaware of the way that these things work in, like, you know, American reality. <laughs> that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's a little bit strange. Um, you know, maybe this is going a little bit far afield of what you see as the, the real kind of um, un-66-like faux pas of this script, but it does seem to me that destroying a bridge as the opening salvo... Um, is, you know, makes Marsha um, a lot more, like, Im- immediately dangerous um, and, dis- and you know, destructive and certainly not someone that you dance with just for old times, <laughs> as Batman, you know, immediately does as, you know, she turns on her tango records um, after the bridge has already been, you know, destroyed and somehow nobody appears to have been hurt, but that seems a little unlikely as well. Yeah, well, about the, the bridge destruction... So during the ceremony, this light comes from the sky and destroys the bridge. And C and C say that they have some stock footage that they you could that could be used to show the destruction of the bridge. So does the stock footage have a beam of light coming out of the sky, <laughs> destroying the bridge? Um, mm. And do we have a way to show the bridge in earlier shots before it's destroyed? Is it going to look the same? Or is it just going to be off screen until it's destroyed? Um, mm. I'm not sure they've completely thought this through. Yeah, that made me that comment um, that aside in the script made me wonder whether the script was like retyped by somebody at Greenway. Maybe I don't know. Um, mm. You know, because like maybe it seems very unlikely for screenwriters to say, oh, we, by the way, we've got some stock footage lying around, what, in their apartments? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't quite sure where that comment came from, or huh. where that, um, that observation really came from. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, unanswerable question, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Are you tired of fanboy comics podcasts? Looking for a show that really appreciates the comic storytelling medium and how it works? A show that looks at comics from any genre and anywhere in the world, comparing the storytelling techniques of different creators in different comics cultures, with manga, newspaper strips, European comics, and more, discussed alongside mainstream U.S. comics. A show that includes talks with well-known creators like James Robinson and Dan Jurgens and with less famous creators that you really should know. And hey, we'll even critique your comic. If you're looking for that show, then you're looking for Deconstructing Comics, and it's right here at deconstructingcomics.com. Also available in iTunes and on Stitcher. This is Tim saying check out our show on Wednesdays. That's Deconstructing Comics. Greetings from Wayne Manor Memoirs, a podcast dedicated to exploring the Batman mythos. Each episode, we research a character, story, contributor, or piece of pop culture related or adjacent to the Dark Knight. And try to understand why these topics are important to the Bat mythos. I'm Joe. I'm Kendall. And some of our favorite topics include the transformation of Mr. Zero into Mr. Freeze. The early appearances of the Riddler. Booster Gold, Commandi, Jim Aparo, and many, many more. Check out Wayne Manor Memoirs every other Friday, wherever you download your podcasts. And follow us at Wayne Manor Memoirs on Facebook or at W Memoirs on Twitter. Until next time, Bat Fanatics, be brave and stay bold. What really surprised me early in the script here was that C and C apparently hadn't even watched the show enough to realize that Batman and Robin landing at the bottom of the bat poles always happens after the commercial break, because they have mm. them jumping into the Batmobile and then going to the opening and the commercials. Right. Like right. you know, if it, if this had been written in '65, that would be you know normal for these scripts. Mm-hmm. But after mm-hmm. season one is over and somebody's still writing a script like that, it's weird it is a little weird and also it does seem unusual um not because it just like can't be done but because it doesn't fit with the template of the show that um batman and robin would run to the bat poles without having gotten at least a confirmation call from gordon first i realize that gordon is actually at 
the site, mm. so he can't pick up a portable bat phone and call Batman and Robin at that point. But um, it just struck me, it, it rang a little false to me, or not really false, but just, you know, kind of out of the ordinary, that they're, you know, you know jumping down the bat poles based on something they saw on television, which is certainly mm. something they could do, but I don't I know think, how often it was actually done. I feel like it show. happened a couple of times. Mm, mm-hmm. I can't remember which right. stories, but... Yeah, like stories in which, again, Gordon may have been tied up, you know, literally or figuratively in some way by (laughs) the disaster itself, Mm -hmm. whatever it might have been. Yeah, or or I'm I'm sure there were a couple of cases where they knew from TV or whatever that something, well, bookworm, because they'd just seen Gordon shot, although it turned out to be a Gordon impersonator. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm a sure... A professional that, Gordon impersonator yeah, from I guess. Gordon Impersonations, LLC. <laughs> <laughs> he, looks, he looks exactly like Neil Hamilton. Uh, yeah, how about that? But, yeah, I'm sure that they there was no bat phone call in that case. Right. For obvious reasons, or seemingly obvious reasons, until it turned out that, that Gordon had not been shot. Right, sure. This is yet another way that this script is derivative of the Bookworm episode. <laughs> When uh, Batman and Robin are in the GCPD, they're, they've got Batman and Robin and Gordon and O'Hara all pacing and crossing each other's paths, just like in the movie. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And, yeah, that struck me, too. And I wondered, was it seems like, well, September 8th, I mean, the movie had just come out. Well, let's see, I guess it was the end of July that they had that, that uh, no, yeah, end of July. So it had been a month. So, yeah, maybe they saw the movie and just decided to do it again, or <laughs> <laughs> or else it was just a coincidence. Yes, I can imagine Semple Jr., like, you know, tearing his hair out, or what was left of it, um, reading the script. It's like, you can't just put, like, old tropes from earlier episodes into a blender and make <laughs> that into, and allow that to be your Batman script. So then a scented envelope arrives for Batman with a Queen of Diamonds playing card inside. And Gordon refers to her as that fiendish female physicist. Nice alliteration. uh, (laughs) Whose love for you turned to revenge when you spurned her affection and sent her to prison. Expository, expository, expository. (laughs) Yeah. So she's a physicist. I know, that blew me away. I was not expecting that. And also the playing card connection, which is not something that Sherman takes advantage of at all. No. That I can recall. That's... That was kind of interesting. You know, the bridge and the pun that Robin comes up with, that, you know, the blowing up the bridge is a you know, signifier of Queen of Diamonds because it's a card that you play in bridge. Um, mm-hmm. that, but, but that gets dropped by the script. And it seems that rather than her being both in love with diamonds and being connected somehow to playing cards in a punny way, probably Sherman cut the playing card stuff or somebody who you know, worked on the script after him did, um, like one of the, like the, you know, the producer's office, um, just because it was like one too many gimmicks or you know, one too many shticks for Marsha to have going for her. Well, whoever was doing that should have taken a look at the Puzzler arc, but uh, mm, anyway. Indeed. indeed. <laughs> um, so did you notice it happens on page eight and then again later, Batman calls Robin Little Chum. Oh, so yeah. Is he the chubby me... eight-year-old Robin? <laughs> yeah, how little is he? He's, pra- you know, he's only about six inches shorter than Adam West. And he's called Little at other points <laughs> in the script, too, by Marsha and by the script itself. The stage directions call him Little. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> yeah, that's a little grating. Yes. I don't, I'm sure that Burr Ward would not have stood for that. <laughs> no. So Batman insists on going alone to talk to Marsha. And he goes to her mountain laboratory. Once again, locations are a bit uh, more expensive than Dozier would ever would ever lay out for. I think. Well, they could have just used the same stock shot as they did with Freeze. <laughs> sure, sure. They could have just shown the stock footage of the bridge. Apparently, there's tons of that lying around. <laughs> and there's no Arab theme. That's all Sherman later, I guess. Um, right. They say it's the hideout is a blend of ladies' home journal and modern electronics. 
Yeah, whatever that means. Tim, why, why, why are her goons named for their fallibility <laughs> rather than for something having to do with diamonds? Knuckles, thumbs, and glass jaw? I mean, you know, all thumbs, um, you know, thumbs is all thumbs. Glass jaw is apparently, you know, very easy to beat up. <laughs> yeah, or as, as High C said on the board, um, why would a woman interested in diamonds, electronics, and ray guns have henchmen named after, checks notes, slang boxing terms? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really good question. Yeah, she says darling a lot, so that kind of tipped me off. We're thinking Jaja here. Sure. And when Batman sees her, um, the script says he stands for a moment overwhelmed by her dazzling beauty. And Heisey says, nope, never. Not how he rolls. <laughs> yeah, I indeed. Agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that just brings up, you know, for me, the fact that it makes no sense. It makes sense if this were a, like a 1950s Dick Sprang drawn Batman comic book story. Mm. This script is actually not bad. Mm-hmm. But um, the the most glaring problem for me with this whole episode is that Batman actually gets brain controlled mm-hmm. by by Marsha instead of doing what he does in the epi- in the you know final you know shot episode which is, you know, overcoming slash resisting Mm -hmm. her charms and her her drug. Right. Well, and in the first two Tut arcs and in Scat Darn Catwoman, he pretended to be mind-controlled. Right. That's right. But, you know, he has to always be a step ahead of the crook, where in in this he's like five steps behind the crook for most of the script. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's that's just wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Now, I, the only time I can think of in the show when he was actually mind-controlled was Black Widow. But, you know, that's late season two, and by that time, almost anything was fair game, I think. But, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but you know, at this point in Batman, no, this would never happen. Yeah, yeah, just it just wouldn't. Like I said, very appropriate for a comic story from this point um, in the series. Maybe even, you know, a new look story um, Mm -hmm. could have had Batman being mind controlled into falling in love and Robin having to pull him out of it. But that just is not the show's formula Mm -hmm. at all for the character. Now, the idea of Marsha controlling men's minds is maybe the only element I noticed that's common to both scripts although Mm -hmm. batman's mind is the only one that she controls in the story she doesn't you know control gordon or O'Hara or anybody else yeah and it's that element that carries over from the original draft um that made me surprised that the that cnc don't get cited as at least you know don't at least get a story by credit in Mm -hmm. in the final episode yeah, I don't know how much of the story would have to be cre- creditable to them in order for them to get a credit, but apparently just that idea wasn't enough. Well, I mean, it's a major, you know, thematic issue in the final arc um, as, it, as it as it was shot. Mm-hmm. You know, if the borderline is like, you know, 50% uh, of, you know, story ideas, um, I guess, you know, the mind control thing wouldn't necessarily count as enough to give the original writers credit, but it's a ubiquitous theme in the, uh, in certainly in the first episode of the arc. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the mind control issue. Yeah. I think that's number one reason why the script wasn't used Mm -hmm. because it's just so far off of how they saw Batman at this point. Right. And I was a little confused about, how he was supposed to be acting here. So she brings this like glass cylinder down around him and uses this machine to control his mind. Mm -hmm. And it says that he walks like an automaton after that and says that he's come to join forces with her. And I was imagining he's probably talking like this, but then later He seems to be talking normally, even though he's still mind-controlled, and there was not really any stage direction of how he was supposed to be acting or talking after that. And it didn't seem like he was being like a robot. No, it didn't. Um, I guess I just chalk that up to the necessity of 
allowing you know things to kind of move on as normal um, as far as performances were concerned that if they could kind of front load his disorientation through slow dialogue um, and then have him kind of you know catch up and seem more normal as it went uh, perhaps the writers thought that that would be enough to clarify that he was mind controlled mm-hmm. but um, I think that you know for a, a half hour show um, in which you know, people are going to be coming and going and not seeing the whole show. I think that there would actually need to be a signifier of his mind control where whenever he shows up while mind controlled, like in the Catwoman episode with, uh, with what's her name? Um, Leslie Gore. Favorite. <laughs> Leslie Gore. That yes. darn Leslie Gore. <laughs> that darn Leslie Gore. <laughs> My aphasia is really kicking in today. I can't think of a single name that I'm trying to bring to mind. Um, but in that episode, um, you know, Robin is um, doing the whole, you know, kind of sneering daddy-o thing and even standing differently while he's mind controlled, <laughs> um, you know, thanks to the cat chemical. Yeah. Um, I can't even think of that today, the name of that stuff today. Probably um, cataphrenic it, or... Uh, yeah, I believe that that's was right. In, in one episode or another, she had cataphrenic. Yeah, but in that episode, you know, you could look at Robin and instantly know that he was still drugged Mm -hmm. um, just because of the way he was standing and smirking. Um, And that would be necessary, I think, just to keep viewers who might have stepped in late, you know, up to date on what was going on with Batman. Um, So something like that, some kind of cue would have been necessary. Right. So, yeah, according to that episode, when you're evil, then you have to talk like you're a swinger and say, hey, cat baby, and (laughs) and all that stuff. That's right. (laughs) So Robin and the GCPD are frantically worried about Batman, and they're trying to call him on a two-way radio that's on Gordon's desk, which Scott pointed out isn't how it would go. Gordon has the bat phone. Robin has a radio on his utility belt or back in the bat cave. Mm, mm. Um, and then also, apparently, the Batacycle is parked at the GCPD, and Robin just goes outside and gets on and drives away. Mm, yeah, yeah, you're right. And here we are again, as with with Ellison's Two Face treatment and the Max Hodge first Mister Freeze having Robin's driving. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um. <laughs> And in fact, in this script, he drives multiple vehicles. <laughs> right, right. Without needing Alfred to chaperone him even, um, you know, mm-hmm. to um, kind of sign on to his learner's permit ride. And yet he's little. So the chubby yes. eight-year-old is driving. <laughs> <laughs> My little legs can hardly reach the pedals. They don't seem to have a clear idea of how old he is at any given moment. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Now... When Robin gets to the hideout, there I did see a sixty sixty element, which was signage, mm, uh, the yes. atomic reactor r- sign, and then th- where Robin is put in, the sign says "isolation cell, no visitors." <laughs> so that really felt like the show, right? Kind of like the thought control cylinder, which I believe had a label as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, it's just weird to see these really 6060 elements mixed in with really un 6060 elements. It's, mm-hmm. it's such a strange mm-hmm. mix. Yeah, it is. Something else um, I wanted to run past you is the talkiness mm. of the episode. Um, yes, there are some you know action sequences with um, you know way out of budget special effects and things like that <laughs> but also that whole um kind of blah blah between um batman and marcia as they're tangoing mm. um you know there's just so much of this is done through dialogue rather than through action mm-hmm. that i think that that you know if i'd been a chubby eight-year-old, which I was at one time, by the way, <laughs> watching this show at home, I would have been bored, bored, bored. <laughs> part one, anyway. I mean, when you get to the miniatures in part two and the uh, the bat wing, um, that would be more interesting, maybe, if it was done sure. well. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. But um, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of, there's too much chat and not enough bat um, in this first episode, mm-hmm. I think, or the first part of the arc. Did you also notice there are a lot of Low quality holies. Oh yeah, yeah, and and holy derivatives <laughs> that um, are not 
Robin like at all. Well, then sometimes he uses other expressions rather than holy, like where he says, What leaping lumbagos? That's what I mean. Yeah. Like, um, on page 28, he <laughs> says, Holy thundering thought control. <laughs> Yeah, and another yeah. place he when he looks finds the nuclear reactor, he just says "holy reactor." <laughs> <laughs> you know, they might as well have just left a blank there. You know, please, uh, Horowitz, please drop in better holy than this one. Um, yeah, leap and lumbago, terrible. <laughs> and. Uh, Oh, Shades of Satan, are we a match for it? Um, yeah, it says, um, I could just see that five. one getting, getting cut by uh, Charles Hoffman. Yeah, it's like, what, this this week's villain is the devil himself? <laughs> the devil it is, <laughs> says Chief O'Hara. So, does Batman ever drive? Because when Batman and Marcia go into town to go to the policeman's ball, Marcia's driving the Batmobile. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe she was worried about the mind control affecting his judgment. I um, guess. His, his reflexes. But... Well, doesn't, doesn't he drive the Batmobile when it becomes basically a submarine when they're, you know, involved nope. in yet another way too expensive special effects sequence? No, Robin's driving in that case. Uh-oh. <laughs> of course he is. Because, because Marsha drives up and gets out of the driver's seat and then they put tied up Robin in the driver's seat. Mm, yeah, well, right, so, yeah, that's in part two, but sure, let's talk about that. So, you know, that she's captured Batman and Robin, and she wants to kill them, and so there are so many problems with this. She puts them in the Batmobile and pulls up these plastic side panels and that seal the cockpit, so we're making alterations to the Batmobile here. I mean, mm-hmm. so what, are we going to call up George Barris again? I don't think so. <laughs> But also, I mean, if you want to kill them, why are you going to lock them into a vehicle that they know more about than you do? <laughs> like To make it look like an accident? Here, Batman and Robin, <laughs> r- rescue yourselves. So, yeah, the, the, the Batmobile is submerged, so I don't know how they're going to manage that. More miniatures, I guess. Mm-hmm. Or maybe just a blue filter. <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking the about lens. the uh, the Riddler John As- John Aston Riddler bank vault fight. Right. But yeah, so of course once they're in there, then they get themselves untied. They pump oxygen into the cockpit, and Robin drives them out of the lake. So you know it's it's not too difficult. Yeah. Why would you seal them in if you're trying to drown them anyway? Um, that, that, I was wondering little... about that too. Why not just leave the cockpit open and drown them and. <laughs> Yeah, why not just throw the freaking Batmobile into the lake with them tied up in it? <laughs> that would seem to be more efficient. Yeah, but then there would then, then there would be no suspense. So many problems with it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, of course they don't want to actually kill them because then there's no more show. But come on. <laughs> yeah, it's like contrivances getting piled upon contrivances that the show just doesn't need. When it looks like the villain doesn't actually want them to die, then you got a problem. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> and when it's exp- when it's as expensive as heck yeah. to rebuild the yeah, Batmobile to make this work, yeah, then we've got some other problems too. Mm-hmm. Yes, you know, this is the point at which um, we all imagine Dozier, you know, pulling the stage direction is Dozier. The parentheses pulls out empty pockets. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, he's the the Monopoly guy. <laughs> pulling yes, his pockets he's out. Uncle 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 Pennybags, you know, shrugging his shoulders when he's got to pay his fifteen dollar, like you know, dog poop tax or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. So when Batman and Marcia go to the policeman's ball, so Gordon and O'Hara at first think that Batman has arrested Marcia, and then they find out that he's working with Marcia, and Marcia says she's going to use her beam. <laughs> which bounces off of her satellite. How much money does she have? She's got a satellite in orbit. So she's going to demolish Gotham City if they don't pay her, what was it, $5 million? Yes, which she makes you know, She makes a good point. You know, the yearly budget of Gotham, City, of Gotham City municipality is $150 million. $5 million is chicken feed. Um, but, you know, how does she make... She's got to be the most successful physicist in the world. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and then when when O'Hara tries to lock them into the hall, then she gets angry and says, okay, I'm going to destroy you. And she and Batman manage to get out as some cops are coming in. And so then I was thinking, what is the gain for her to actually destroy Gotham City? Mm-hmm. Just, well, revenge, I guess. But she, she ain't getting no $5 million then. <laughs> That's right. Once she's actually destroyed it, there's yeah. uh, you know, less less chance of the five million dollars coming through. Of oh. course, you know, then if she wanted to knock over other cities, they would look at Gotham City and say, Oh well, we better give her the five million dollars or she's gonna destroy our city as well. Yeah, I guess. I just, I just want to know why I mean, maybe this is a good a, a positive moment where C and C, you know, are expressing their clear understanding of the Gotham City PD. Why do Gordon and O'Hara think that Batman would bring Marsha to the policeman's ball after having arrested her? Hmm. Maybe because there are a lot of police there? They always give Batman the benefit of the doubt, so... I suppose so. You know, maybe he wanted to have one last dance with her. Maybe he just thought there were a lot of policemen there and he could... (laughs) He can turn Marsha over to one of them. <laughs> Here, could you please take her to, to the jail? Never mind yeah, having yeah. a trial. Just yeah, I realize, I realize you're enjoying the party, but I really, you know, I really need this woman booked. <laughs> so later on, uh, Gordon gets on the police radio and says Batman should be apprehended at all costs and to shoot on sight if necessary. Now we're in a penguin episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You'll never take me alive, coppers. <laughs> so at the hideout, at Marsha's hideout, they hear part of that radio announcement because I think what is it, Knuckles is monitoring the police radio. Mm-hmm. So taking a break from, you know, being the sidekick of Sonic the Hedgehog, by the way. <laughs> So Different Bat- knuckles, I guess. Batman and Robin have heard that, but yet later, after they got it, get out of the lake and they run into a police barricade, they think, oh, we'll have the police follow us. They've completely forgotten about the radio until the police start shooting at them, like, oh, that's right, they think we're cooks. <laughs> <laughs> An important detail to remember at this point when they're, you know, the order is to shoot them on sight. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> oh man so yep. yeah and then the big finish when they they go back to the bat cave go into the hangar at the bat cave so where did that come from that's mm. why i think they've been reading some comics because there was yep. never a hangar in the bat cave in on the show nope. and they get in the bat wing and robin is driving the bat wing and they <laughs> fly up and they shoot down the satellite <laughs> <laughs> with missiles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure all the stock footage of the world is going to help anybody at Greenway with this one. I was imagining something like, I don't know, Thunderbirds type of... <laughs> right. right. With <laughs> and this, you got you know, some little missiles on, on strings that are flying over, in, you know, slowly flying over to the satellite... Yes, yeah, so and the cinematographer is like praying, please don't make the dental floss visible. Please don't let the dental floss be visible. <laughs> and how high does this Batwing fly that it can shoot a satellite down? <laughs> These are very good questions, Tim. I have no answers for any of them. And neither do they. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I, I wonder if uh, if Dozier and Horowitz ever called the Arthur Kenner Associates Incorporated Talent Agency again after this. <laughs> um, I would think not. Well, we wanted to get Charles Lawton as a villain on the show, but not anymore. I'm not going to call those guys back. <laughs> uh, some other things that Scott said. Uh, wow, a pretty terrible script of mindless actions just to move from one point to another. Hmm. She sweet talks her way through the parole board only to go right out and fire a laser beam and then send Batman a card to invite him to her lair. All this to get the ball rolling, or rather flopping downhill, as it deflates further and further only to sludge its way to an end. Other than Robin figuring a clue about a card, the dynamic duo are presented with everything mindlessly and waltz their way from one point of dialogue to the next. The dialogue of the regulars is really flat, 
and all in all don't fit the characters saying them as we know them by this point of the series, especially Batman and Robin. Translate this as terrible writing, or not knowing who you're writing for, or have you ever watched the show? <laughs> Very astute analysis. <laughs> Although, um, the only contrarian point I would make would be that I thought that Gordon and O'Hara were fairly well characterized. Yeah, fairly I did too. characterized with their, what we know about them up to this point. Mm -hmm. They're incompetent, they're overly dependent on Batman, and they they have the same kinds of verbal tics um, that uh, they have on the, on the, on the show mm -hmm. normally. Um, he also pointed out that the only time we see Aunt Harriet is in the very last scene, in the, the tag of part two, Mm -hmm. uh, where Bruce and Dick are, you know, at Wayne Manor, and uh, Dick is saying he never wants to hear the name Queen of Diamonds again, and they go to the living room, and Aunt Harriet's there with her bridge club, and she mentions the Queen of Diamonds. Yeah, <laughs> wah wah wah. <laughs> yeah, and so the card motif comes back once more in the episode after mm -hmm. being gone since the first five, you know, after the first five minutes of episode one. Yeah, uh, Andy Fish responded to that. Haven't read the script yet, but Marsha being two of my least favorite episodes, it's good to know it could have been worse. Great summary, <laughs> Scott. <laughs> and part of what High C wrote, not only is Batman passive throughout, as Scott said, the character is way off from what he has been established as. He is completely unprepared. Yes, yes. Unprepared for everything and anything that happens to him. Yep. Yeah, he's he's not on top of anything. And like I said, five steps behind the villain for most of right. it. Right. Robin is a more effective crime fighter than Batman in the script. Right, right. Yeah, this is almost like a you know, Robin solo adventure for a few stretches <laughs> in there. Mm -hmm. Tim, it's been you know it's been a few weeks since I watched Marsha Marsha last because I watched it um, before we talked about women in season two. Yeah. Um, but do you remember if it had been established before that Marsha had bent men's minds with her psychotropic drug before? Or was this the first time she had used the you know darts of love that she's having her oh. henchmen unleash at people like O'Hara and Gordon? I don't remember if it was mentioned that that was a pre-existing M.O. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel like it was, but I can't remember yeah. anything specific and maybe it doesn't matter but it does seem that in, mo in most cases you know the villains have some shtick that batman and robin are always talking about even if it's the first appearance of that villain on the show batman and robin will say well you know joker always does this or you know riddler's psychosis is mm. that um that he's you know always trying to flaunt his crimes with with his uh, with his riddles, so I just you know wondered if this was a, an mo that had been established beforehand in the episode as shot that might be another kind of you know sixty six difference that the um, CNC weren't on board for, mm -hmm. um, or a sixty six trait um, that yeah. is you know setting up the the villain's mo. Just you know something for us to think about as we continue to build our own. Yeah, mental Bible for the show, um, as we've been doing for the last five years. Yeah, um, seven years at this seven point. Seven years, yeah. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Hmm. So, yeah, no mystery about why this wasn't produced. No. <laughs> no, and, you know, it may very well be that the only reason that Marsha Queen of Diamonds ended up with her own script at all after this was because they'd already lined up Zsa, Zsa Gabor to play a character named Marsha Queen of Diamonds. Yeah, maybe, and then Mar and then she couldn't do it, so they got Carolyn. But right, right, mm. and then for some reason brought her back with Penguin. That well, it's been speculated that maybe she was burning off a contract with ABC, and that was why she was in that three-parter. Right, right, of course. Left over from her Adam her uh, Adams family days. Right. Hello, I'm Ken Holtzhauser, and if you're looking for something new in comic books, may I recommend my newest comic, The Quick and the Dad, a love letter to the DC, Marvel, Archie, and Harvey comics of my youth. It, this comic has everything. It has spaceships, dad jokes, 
alien invasions, time travel, supervillains, and so many bad puns. Hopefully you'll like it. It's the cutest comic you've never heard of, and it's available today in print and digital from IndiePlanet.com. That's the quick and the dad. Join that other dynamic duo, won't you? Coming up, Adam and Bert talk about the casting of the villains for Batman the Movie, and we read your mail in the Bat Inbox. Help support To The Bat Polls and all the Deconstructing Comics shows with a monthly donation to the Deconstructing Comics Patreon page at patreon.com slash deconcomics. For just $2 a month, you get outtakes from every To The Bat Polls episode. Plus, Paul and I make bi-weekly videos for all patrons usually featuring a TV trivia quiz. Last week's video touched on Batman, Star Trek, and The Electric Company, and next week's focuses on The Bionic Woman and other classic 70s shows. Patrons can also vote in polls for which bat topic you'd like us to cover next. Further perks at higher support levels, including the right to have an ad for your own project on the show once a month, and hours of podcasts on the early issues of The Amazing Spider-Man, and on the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So go to patreon.com slash deconcomics and select the level of your monthly donation. Thanks for listening and thanks for your support. I think what was fun about the feature was that instead of just being limited to one villain, we had four, and we had four of the most popular villains. Our executive producer, um, Bill Dozier, and uh, producer Charlie Fitzsimons and another producer, Bill D'Angelo, had remarkable talent for picking the right people. And, you know, you think of the villains that we had. We had Cesar Romero, the great Latin lover. We put white makeup over his mustache because Cesar would not shave the mustache that gave him a career. But um, <clears throat> uh, Burgess Meredith, who had, you know, a long, uh, wonderful career in movies on the stage. Um, Frank Gorshin, with his manic intensity as Riddler. Leanne Merriweather as Catwoman. Uh, although uh, Julie Newmar was our main Catwoman in the series, she was uh, filming a movie called McKenna's Gold at the time, so we needed another Catwoman, and uh, Leanne Merriweather was terrific. We have to do something to get Batman out of the way. Bat Inbox on episode 173 about the development of the show, uh, and we only got one message on the board from Mr. Glee, so Paul, please read it. Here it is. Regarding the question of why the producers would have approached Eric Ambler to write the pilot, check out these comments from Fox executive William Self, who attended an early meeting with ABC executives to first discuss a possible Batman series. And here's the quote. I know how to do it. I know what will make it work. And everybody said, tell us. In order to appeal to adults, we have to have adult type writing. And we have to have a prestigious writer so they won't laugh it off when they first find out we're doing Batman. And they said, have you got anyone in mind? And I said, yes, Eric Ambler. Now, I picked Eric Ambler out of the blue because I admired him. And secondly, I had a way to get to Eric Ambler in that he was a friend of Bill Dozier. So I called Dozier and I said, we want to do Batman and I'd like to get Eric Ambler to write it. And he, Dozier, said, it's a great idea. I'll set up a luncheon. So we had lunch and I told Mr. Ambler what I wanted to do and he laughed at me. He was very charming, but he said, Bill, I'm not going to write Batman. I'm not going to do it. So we gave up on that. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much a no. Um, but I, now I had Dozier involved with me, and Dozier came up with the other writer. It was simple. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and then there's the link. Yeah, it's um, which, Television uh, Academy interview. Yes, our, our favorite. Um, <laughs> one of our favorite sources. Tim will post that. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Going on with Mr. Glee's comment. Uh, Self's comments suggest that the earliest intention for Batman was not to play it as camp or comedy, but to treat it as a sort of James Bond adjacent action adventure show. So it was only after Semple became involved that the humorous approach was settled on. I'm of two minds about that, Mr. Glee. Um, I think that if you, you know, and I'm sure you've you know seen them, but uh, if you watch especially the early James Bond movies, but even up through the I would say through the, I almost called him Remington Steel. <laughs> <laughs> through the, um, Pier, what's his Pierce name? Pierce Brosnan. Era. Pierce Brosnan, yes. There I am having aphasia again. Even up through that era, there was a, a lot of um, self-referential comedy and, um, you know, uh, 
the the joke with both Roger Moore and with Sean Connery was that um, he was kind of in on the joke that he was you know so suave and debonair that it was just absolutely impossible for him to be so and still <laughs> do the kinds of things that he did um, you know on camera. So um, I think and Ambler's reputation was a little bit on the the quirky side. He was a respected novelist, but I'm thinking of Journey into Fear with a Orson Welles. He didn't direct it, but he probably actually secretly did direct um, Journey into Fear back in the 40s, um, was a kind of, um, you know, why is this happening to me movie where, you know, a, a someone you know keeps running into all these impossible situations that seem to have to do with a great deal more than him. That is, they're like into their international intrigue and all that. Kind of like some of Hitchcock's films about Americans, you know, stuck in Europe um, and suddenly in the midst of, you know, intrigue. Or even some of his early British films where, you know, ordinary Brits are stuck in those kinds of um, espionage situations. Um, I think that, you know, Ambler um, may have been on that kind of track. Although what's interesting about this is we might be able to map, uh, you know, a sense of what the humor was expected to be like or what the makers of the show, creators of the show wanted the humor to be like. We kind of map it from a James Bond wryness through the camp aesthetic that we wound up with and Ambler might be an interesting piece of that puzzle or a kind of signpost on the route. Mm -hmm. So you think simple might've built on that possibility? I'm thinking more a kind of bird's eye view of the development of the comic tone of the show might be to think, you know, they started with a more James Bondian wryness or, you know, almost a kind of, you know, sarcasm <laughs> about, um, you know, where the action is certainly action adventure, but it's also a little playful in a kind of self-referential winking sense, like James Bond's early and late films have been. But uh, that, you know, Semple took it in a different direction, but there was already a kind of comic mm. element to it or an expectation of a certain kind of adult comedy, mm. which, you know, camp counts as adult comedy, too, if it's camping, at least. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you can write to us at batpoles at deconstructingcomics.com or comment on our blog at to thebatpoles.libsyn.com. And, of course, there's a thread about this episode on the 66batman.com message board. Message board hasn't been too active lately. Yeah. Um, maybe kind of in general. I think um, there have been... I guess there's been a fair amount of traffic, just not much traffic about our episodes in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's see if we can change that. We love to hear from you, and it uh, makes the tent uh, you know, a little bigger for these conversations, which we always enjoy and appreciate. Yeah, so we thought we would try to come up with a question every time and have you comment on that, as well as, of course, commenting on other things that happened in this episode. So our question for this time is, what villain team-up do you wish the show had done? Now, of course, Ooh. we had the four-way team-up in the movie. Kind of set that aside. Let's just think about the TV show. You know, we had okay. Catwoman and Sandman. We had Joker and Penguin. We had, you know, the weird, semi not very satisfying team-ups in season three. Well, we had, did have Joker and Catwoman. Ooh. Not not the same Catwoman we had before, but and not really the same Joker either. <laughs> <laughs> well, even though he's played by the same actor. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah, think about what what you wish they had done in terms of team ups, and next time uh, more Marcia. But we'll move on to the one that everybody's familiar with, the one Stanford Sherman wrote. Uh, we have a final script. But, of course, there are always differences between the quote-unquote final script and what ended up broadcast. So we'll be taking a look at that next time. So, Tim, um, should we call the next episode Marsha, Marsha, Marsha? <laughs> in, in honor of the Brady Bunch, I suppose. <laughs> oh, my nose. It's always Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> as, spo as spoken by Jan Brady, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or we could call it "Oh my nose." That would be a yeah. really, really kind of, you know, uh, sidelong um, yeah. reference to the show. Yeah. Or I'll never wash this cheek again. <laughs> <laughs> How about a flip side? Says Davy Jones. <laughs> so we'll be back in two weeks here at the same bat RSS feed.
Check the show notes for the YouTube video of the big smuzz version of the theme, the Marsha script that we talked about, the William Self TV Academy interview, and the Bat Message Board thread about our episode on the development of the Batman show. If you have comments, any interesting bat audio that we haven't used yet on the show, or you would like to make a donation to the show through PayPal, the address is batpolls at deconstructingcomics.com. We're on Twitter at Decon Comics and on the Deconstructing Comics channel on YouTube. You can hear outtakes from this and every episode of To the Bat Polls and vote for topics for future episodes by supporting us at patreon.com slash deconcomics. You can also help us out by shopping via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon, by sharing our episodes on your social media, and by subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And spread the word. Let all your friends who are Batman 66 fans know about the show. What you're hearing now is Nancy Sinatra with Who Will Buy. Next time, Stanford Sherman's Marsha script. Now I'm off to try to sell the Bat computer in the atomic pile. We'll see you in two weeks. Who will buy this wonderful feeling? I'm so high, I swear I could fly. Me, oh my, I don't want to lose it. So what am I to do to keep the sky so blue? There must be someone who will buy. To the Bat Poles is a production of DeconstructingComics.com.